Dear friends, welcome on Alatra TV. Today we have two very special guests, independent researchers Raz and Christian. And my co-hosts today are Anastasia and Jason. And we will be talking about ancient connections and megalithic structures. And um, we for sure will have a very, very interesting conversation. Uh, I'm gonna ask Christian this next question about the Assyrian structure. And before I do, Christian, you know, everyone talks about uh, the Sphinx and everyone talks about the pyramids. Uh, let's talk about the Assyrian structure uh, that isn't too far away from these enigmatic sites and discuss what's, uh, what's been found underneath it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess the Osirion is the one of the most enigmatic uh, structures in all of uh, ancient Egypt, you know, uh, because, you know, everyone uh, is uh, all about the pyramids and uh, the Sphinx. And uh, you know, we can see why, you know, the, the Giza pyramid is the Great Pyramid is one of the most uh, fascinating uh, monuments of uh, ancient times. Um, but the Osirion which uh, might might be connected actually with the uh, with the uh, with the pyramids and the sphinx too because uh Zahi Hawass, the head of egyptology pretty much you know all of the the head of pretty much everything in egypt that uh, regards archaeological sites um although he's a mainstream thinker about those structures he said that uh, that three shafts uh, might have been found uh, beneath the Osirian. All of these three shafts might lead to the underneath the pyramids and underneath the Sphinx. This would uh, allow us uh, to infer what the original discoverer of the Osirian uh, said, which is uh, Sir Edward Neville of the Smithsonian Institute, uh, who discovered the Osirian, rediscovered uh if we may because herodotus already talked about this uh, uh, underground structure in his uh, in his fourth books of, of the of the stories and uh he was completely baffled to say the least and uh neville believed that the osirian was the oldest structure in all of ancient egypt and we we're talking about a, you know an expert here and uh I guess if he believed so, uh, I, I, we have no reason to, to why not believe him, you know. Also, uh, you know, the evidence is uh, even eyewitnessing evidence, you know. If, if we just see th this structure and uh, what it's all about, um, we know for a fact that ancient Egyptians of the Old Kingdom Consider this site already sacred. All right. And uh, Seti I built his temple uh, on top of the Osirian. You know, it was placed uh, far above it. And this alone lets us to speculate that the Osirian was from a, a, a uh, consider, uh, considerably earlier period of time because its foundation are way lower than the levels of, uh, you know, the Egyptians' uh, buildings, you know, like the, the, the Seti First Temple. And he built his temple above the Osirian specifically, specifically to protect this site. That's how sacred it was uh, in, that, in that period already. And they believed that uh, the body of Osiris himself was buried right there. So therefore, we have this mythological element that the ancient Egyptians already believed and had. You know, we might, we might, we might hypothesize from this that they didn't even know, you know, uh, the, the actual origin of the Osirian because they already gave the structure mythological, uh, a mythological uh, property or account, you know. Uh, just looking at the way it was built, it's unlike everything we can find throughout ancient Egypt and only matches the architectural uh, structures of the Sphinx Temple, which is the Valley Temple, which is uh, beside the Sphinx, and uh, the inside of the Great Pyramid. 
you know, where we can find this uh, huge polygonal uh, megalithic masonry. And uh, the style of the Osirian uh, perfectly matches the style of the South American structures, for instance, like uh, at Olanta Itambo, we can see uh, that the blocks and the megaliths were quarried and uh, put into place and fit together with the same identical processes and craftsmanship used in the Osirian, for example, and the Sphinx Temple, right? And we're talking about the we're talking about the mortarless architecture. The blocks are placed without mortar, one on top of the other, in a way that not even um, a razor blade uh, can fit between them. You know, and that it's uh, enigmatic uh, by itself. Um, as a result uh, of the same techniques and processes of uh, craftsmanship to build these sites, we have uh, the ones that uh, we researcher uh, called the knobs. You know, in several megalithic blocks, we can see this. Um, this like really like knobs that are protruding from the from the block you know we don't know and the mainstream archaeology doesn't know uh, what was the purpose of this uh, of these uh, knobs of these features that were left uh, on the blocks and uh, we don't know if they were involved in some part of the processes of lifting them or of quarrying them but what we can be sure of is that if the these identical knobs these identical marks are on the stones of japan are on the stones of egypt are on the stones of the mediterranean uh, mediterranean area are on the stones of uh, south america there must there must have been uh, a similar process involved in their craftsmanship you know so it's either that they came, uh, they came across this, this technique all by themselves and in, in every part of the world, which I find, uh, I, find, I find it to be a stretch, even more a stretch than to hypothesize that they might have had some sort of contact or they might have been a single global megalithic civilization or they might have had a common ancestor from uh, which they took this knowledge. Um, so returning to the Osirian, the Osirian was built uh, with those properties in mind, like those that we discussed before, anti-seismic properties, mortarless architecture, very sound. Um, the columns of the Osirian are unbelievably uh, huge and uh, perfectly like laser cut uh, columns made of uh, pink granite too. And, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to, to, to imagine how they could have uh, even uh, worked, you know, achieved such levels of perfection. We must bear in mind that the Osirian was covered with lintels that were several hundreds of tons heavy and uh, to cover, to cover the, the structures, the pillars that were already put into place, they must have been uh, placed from above. So now imagine placing from above uh, like perfectly aligned uh, lintels and made of megalithic uh, like uh, uh, stones of 200, uh, 200 tons and more, you know? Uh, that would require an incredible level of, uh, you know, advanced thinking, engineering, and all that stuff. And maybe uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Speaking, speaking of, uh, speaking of uh, engineering, there's an Italian engineer called Antonio Rubino, who went to the Osirian, became completely fascinated with the structure, and began, uh, began studying the structure and its mathematical proportions. He has found that uh, the um, what we call divine proportion, you know, like the the aureus sexual, you know, 
the fee, the golden number, the golden ratio, uh, was used to, throughout the whole building of the Osirion. And uh, the central square that we found, which is full of water, the waters of the Nile, uh, because the Osirion is, uh, you know, conducts the water of the Nile and was used even to imagine how advanced was the structure. It was also used to control the levels of water of the Nile. Uh, the central square uh, perfectly matches the golden ratio, the golden proportions. Yeah. And, this all, and it is also uh, in scale of the, of the king's chamber in the Giza pyramid. The main square perfectly matches the king's chamber in the Giza pyramid, not only the, um, the little uh, square that is filled with water inside the Osirion ma completely matches uh, the proportions of the red granite sarcophagus that is found inside the king's chamber. Uh, therefore, we, we, you know, I've, I'm really convinced that the Osirian is unlike anything that uh, is in Egypt, and it only matches the, the three main Giza pyramids and the Sphinx and the Valley Temple. Those are the three oldest sites in Egypt. Um, and they match. They match architecturally, engine, engineeringly, you know, and uh, they were built with advanced and sophisticated knowledge. And they are not like the other uh, old and new kingdom structures that we see that although they are incredible and they require, uh, they must have required incredible craftsmanship too, but they are unlike those real megalithic uh, uh, advanced structures. And, um, uh, you know, another fascinating uh, thing that allows us to match those uh, three sites is that in neither of the, those three structures, the Giza pyramids, the Osirion, and the Sphinx, no hieroglyphs were found. You know, this matches the fact that this uh, previous civilization not only was advanced, but uh, like I, I like to say, uh, they had an egoless approach when it came to um, build those sites. They just had the purpose and uh, you know the usefulness in mind, like astronomically uh, and other purposes. But they had this egoless approach. They didn't left any writings on them. Uh, so in this way, they are similar too, because we know for a fact that Egy ancient Egyptians used to cover uh, with hieroglyphs all their uh, or their sites and their tombs, right? Uh, while the, the main pyramid, you know, doesn't have hieroglyphs. And um, the Osirion neither. And uh, they are only placed uh, inside the, the, the entrance, you know, but it's clear that they were, they was placed there later because they have reference to Seti I, which was the, the person that, the Pharaoh that built his temple above it to preserve it. Therefore, yeah, I think the Osirian is one of the oldest and most precise uh, structures of uh, all Egypt. You know, we can we can uh, we can even match this with uh, what we were what I was talking about earlier about Plato Scritia, uh, when he says that uh, the descendants of uh, Atlantis, you know, had this uh, approach. Uh, to the to the building of the sites, he says that the temple dedicated to Poseidon that was built in Atlantis uh, was uh, for those who witness it, which uh, for the record were the Egyptians, because the Egyptians in the Crisia were said to uh, be the you know the bearers of this lost knowledge of millennia before. This temple was stark. It had no inscriptions. It was like uh, primitive looking, yet incredibly advanced uh, because of the megalithic uh, features. You know, these are all elements that we can uh, logically link together. Yes, thank you. I mean, there's a lot of uh, um, evidence that uh, would 
point to the fact that uh, these were some very precise, precisely built machines, uh, like the or they had some function. Uh, also, the absence of hieroglyphs or any other signs or ornaments. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of um, things and the dimensions that are the same. They might have been used to um, um, to generate the same standing waves, if uh, you want, inside these chambers. Uh, so uh, the uh, this is why they are polished and the measurements are like uh, to a millimeter <laughs> precise. Yeah. So yeah, uh, there's definitely something in common and as we also uh, think that um, uh, they used the uh, low uh, frequency uh, transmission through the grounds so the, this may be like it you know receiving piece of this i mean the assyrian might be a receiving piece for the energy coming from the pyramids or some sort of a uh, transceiver. So yeah, I hope of we course. find one day. <laughs> of course, that, that, that would ex explain the, the tunnels uh, that go uh, underneath the Osirion yeah. and the, the Giza pyramid. And also would explain the, uh, the fact that uh, there's a chamber besides the, yeah. beside the Osirion, a chamber that uh, was built with... Uh, the same uh, dimensions, yeah. Yes, yeah, same dimensions, mega and, and the, the, above. And the deflectors, yes, for, yes, for the Yes, which yeah. gives mm -hmm. the, which gives the, you know, the room uh, incredible acoustic properties. Yes, yes. Yeah, and which redire redirects the, uh, the sound yes. waves precisely that, that, to, that was uh, also to the sarcophagus. The, that, yeah. Yeah, would, would also match the hippogeum at Malta and the Barabar caves in India, you know, that were built all, the, all yeah. with uh, specific uh, acoustic, re S acoustic resonators. Yeah. yeah. Jason, would you like to add something before, before you uh, sign off? Hey, guys, before I get out of here, I just wanted to discuss one thing with both of you and ask this question directly of you since you both have done a lot of research into the spirituality, into the ancient structures, into the cultures, and I like how you guys call them cultures and civilizations. Um, all of these sites and all of these similarities point to the fact that we're, we're obviously dated over 15,000 years ago, and in some cases upwards of 81,000, but it's not conclusive. Uh, would you say that the reason this isn't really discussed is because it's a hard pill to swallow that this challenges Darwinism? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, I guess more than uh, more than Darwinism, because you know, modern humans exist from way before uh, the even the buildings of those sites. Even if we say that those sites were, uh, you know, seventy thousand years old, uh, modern humans were already thriving. Therefore, I just think it would be just a threat to modern archaeology. To modern history because uh, um, then the all the academic environment would have to uh, reconsider and rebuild the, their theories you know because the picture is completely off uh, therefore yeah uh, and, and not only they would have to rebuild that but they would they you know I, like we wouldn't have the means you know, uh, although uh, even though we can say that these sites are really uh, like uh, 12,000 years old, 15,000 years old, then who built them? We don't have we don't have the answer, you know, so uh, it would be pretty difficult and rough for mainstream uh, archaeology, because not only all the theories and all the picture would fall apart, but they and we wouldn't have anything to replace that to replace that void you know that would generate yeah and definitely i mean even if um thank you thank you if it was built 15 years thousand years ago uh it means that the civilization had to go for several thousands of years before that right yes. it's not like they appeared 15000 years ago exactly. and then immediately built, built the, uh, these megalithic structures precisely <laughs> precisely and th and then um, what I, what i like to think is that uh, you know they went through some phases and ultimately uh, uh, you know they made this this approach at last which is really advanced because if we really uh, consider 
all the low frequency, all the energies and all, the, all of that stuff, which we can also see in the thousands of stone circles around the world, which have incredible uh, electromagnetic properties, like the, the South, Africa sto South African stone circles. There are several thousands of them. Dr. Michael Tellinger uh, made the, the research and found that they generate incredible toroidal fields, uh, which goes up into the sky for several uh, gigahertz so therefore the, these alignments are also in france like the karnak alignments so they would have had some purpose all of these structures they would have uh, they had to have a meaning back then and a purpose and uh, it was surely some energetic purpose so we can speculate that this civilization was so advanced that they utilized only the earth energy you know, it was a green, uh, green civilization. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, obviously, I mean, um, we can't even lift uh, the stones that were used to build the pyramids. Exactly. Like, well, we we can sort of, but uh, it would take uh, six months to prepare one lift and uh, thirty exactly. people uh, team of engineers just to prefer, prepare the crane. You know, that would lift it. Uh, exactly. only once but there are like millions of those uh so yeah <laughs> obviously this uh, this is uh, quite complicated and regarding the energies also uh definitely they used uh, more uh friendly and uh, free sources of energy right. to uh, empower their civilization so uh, this is very interesting so uh, but then we um i think this can uh, slowly bring us to the uh, to cyclicity, right? Because uh, since there the uh, civilizations came and uh, went extinct, there should be some extinction level event that would yeah. wipe out the whole uh, civilization several times over, uh, yes. leaving to us some of the uh, structures that we see today. Uh, we barely understand how. <laughs> they were built, uh, yes. not to say that we don't understand what was the purpose. Uh, so did you guys find anything uh, that relates to this um, cataclysmic event or maybe like nuclear war? Because uh, obviously, if you research these things, you've heard about the microspherals that uh, are everywhere. And this is a sign of um, this kind of uh, like uh, weapons being used all over the planet and we can <clears throat> we can go to uh, ancient texts like Mahabharata and uh, uh, speaking about the I mean depicting uh, the uh, uh, nuclear war so can you um, tell us something about this yeah it's a it's a very interesting uh, question and really relevant question I would like to add on this one uh, but first of all, I'd like to say a few things about the, the cycles. Like if you look at the time frame that uh, it took us to go from the dark ages until the technology we have today, it's not a, really a big time frame. It's actually a glimpse on the radar, just a tiny, tiny bit. So it's been like, what, 500, 500 years, something like this. So we've been like, history is like a roller coaster. And it takes like 500 years of development to reach like this stage, imagine what uh, humanity can accomplish in 1000 or 1500 years. And this is like really interesting when you look at the different time frames because this is really relevant to determine the, the, the cycles, like how long are the cycles, like the, the four cycles of life described in the Hindu texts, because they're like spanning over thousands, sometimes tens or hundred thousands of years. But is it like this? Because I've been like studying Neolithic civilizations and uh, like there was a time when um, like 7,000 years ago when uh, civilization was really peaceful, like was really egalitarian, was uh, a matriarchy. Um, so this happened like 7,000 years ago, like all the houses were the same and people had like temples inside, inside their houses or like what we consider today as primitive, but we can say like they had simple lives. But then if we look uh, to the, to this, I'm talking about uh, Europe and South America, like here people 7,000 years ago were, were like this. But then if you look uh, at the other places on the map, 
there were civilizations that developed so much faster. Of course, they uh, vanished as fast as they came. But if you look at this, so 7,000 years ago, we were pretty simple. And if you look at the um, Indus, Hindus Valley civilization that spanned like from present day Pakistan until like Northern India and even further, um, they were really advanced civilization, like more than 4,500 years ago. So this is like reaching through the Neolithic times. They had, um, they had such advanced cities like the Mohenjo-Daro or Lothar or Harappa cities. So they were so advanced uh, that they had like plumbing systems with uh, terracotta pipelines, like sewage, they had uh, houses with more floors. They had bath bathrooms on uh, the, the second floor. It's, it's evidence about that as well. So when you're like then considering like 4,000 years over this uh, period when we we're like in the dark ages in Europe and we had like like people in uh, in England were like literally throwing their uh, fecals out the windows. So it was a, it's like a really huge leap. From Only a couple of hundred that. years ago, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but it's also like a really quick transition from the Neolithic where people are like really simple. And then a, a few thousand years uh, later, they achieved such a great level of uh, development. Of course, the civilizations remain like really enigmatic. They were part of the, like the Indus Valley civilization were part of the um, uh, Halaf, Halaf culture. Yeah, the Ubaid one was uh, further down in Mesopotamia. And we know about these cultures. They had this enigmatic statuettes with the... Uh, These are shape, uh... Yeah, lizard shaped, lizard shaped uh, figurines holding like a suckling with uh, reptilian features. Of course, from what I've uh, researched, those uh, like Neolithic people um, had a lot of zoomorphic uh, figurines. Like they were really spiritual or into the animal realm. So uh, those not necessarily mean they were like. Uh, reptiles or something like reptilians i don't want to get into that subject because it's really broad i just wanted to point the different advancement levels uh and the time frames that are so small like in a small time frame we can achieve a really high uh, uh technological or development or yeah, social but, but or also structural what I think that we might consider the fact that, um, you know, being, uh, having a simple uh, lifestyle doesn't mean not being advanced, because this can be a choice. Imagine if these were the sur uh, survivors uh, after uh, some sort of um, yeah, event that could wipe out uh, the yeah. humanity, and they understood that being like really going into uh, technologies uh, that made this... Uh, war or event possible maybe they could have you know like have the free energy from the pyramids and still have uh, running water and uh, bathrooms on the second floor you know <laughs> and uh, yeah. have a great life yeah like in this case i've been thinking a lot and it only makes sense that uh, it's very very interesting because we can compare what is happening today and have a broader perspective of uh, what may have happened uh, in the past, in the sense that today, like we have uh, a bunch of people or institutions, uh, let's just call them the powers that be, that they have a lot of resources and they also have a lot of insight and knowledge. Some of it they're keeping away from prying eyes, which is us, like the people. And in case of a cataclysm, they have the, mo the, the, the highest chances of survival. And what would happen? Like 90% the, like of humanity would turn back to the Stone Age level and they would survive only to, preser to preserve the technology. And then as humans start uh, like reproducing and re uh, inhabiting the earth again, they can you know, come and uh, see the the minds of people at different points in time, at different locations, and like they can come and boast with their technology, like look, and everybody would look at them as gods. And I think this is what 
it's interesting because this is, I think, what happened uh, during the Neolithic times, at least in Europe. Uh, something very interesting happened because we had the, like we had matriarchy, we were egalitarian, and we were living peacefully. There were no weapons. There were only tools, like only tools for doing the agriculture and. Uh, yeah, and there stuff. were no scarred bodies uh, uh, found, uh, no remains that uh, showed that uh, there were wars or conflicts. Uh, and yeah. no traces of fortifications until the later yes. period of the Neolithic. Uh, when uh, the what's interesting is that the um, the Kurgan people came. This is how uh, Maria Jimbutas is one Lithuanian uh, archaeologist who studied the Neolithic people, uh, like coined the term of Kurgan people. Kurgan means tumuli, tum tumulus. And they came from the Russian steppes and they they learned how to domesticate the horses and they had weapons. They learned how to forge armors and swords and all this stuff and they came into the old european like this is how the indo-european languages came with the Korgan people who basically invaded the old europe this is how it's called like western eastern europe they invaded it and conquered the, the people what's interesting in the name of the sky gods so they came and said my my idea is the sky gods came to them and taught them how to, you know, do a lot of things. And then uh, they were really, really thrilled about this and started conquering in the name of the sky gods because maybe the sky gods said, okay, go there and do that. Like, uh, yeah, be before we were with the, like the Neolithic cultures were with the mother goddess. They were really in touch, in tune with the, with the earth, with the spiritual realm. And then the, the, the 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 you know the the Kurgan people came with their sky gods and this is really uh, really matches the what we have uh, in the Western uh, world uh, the apocrypha book known as the Book of Enoch that uh, describes uh, a fall of the angels actually a banishing of the angels from the heavenly realm that come to earth and they uh, teach people um, about forging weapons, building armors, they about witchcraft, about astronomical, they give them knowledge. And this is pretty much in relation to this. And I also discovered it's in relation with the Hindu texts, like what we call uh, the fallen angels, they call uh, the Asuras. And uh, it's well known, like in the book of Enoch, it, said, it says that the, those angels, they settled here on earth so after they were banished they built their own cities so they had like uh, their own followers people worshiping them enjoying the lifestyle lifestyle brought by those uh, fallen angels and in hindu mythology they're called asuras and uh, all uh, like hindu people are aware that we are the byproduct of uh, like the people living then like the devas and asuras the gods and the demigods and um, yeah, they're they're pretty linked together, but I don't want to dive into this topic right now. I just wanted to mention it for yeah. sure because there, there's there's a lot of, uh, in terms of uh, ancient technology. As you mentioned, uh, um, there could have been a nuclear warfare. This is actually what caught my attention a while back it was like uh, among the first things that caught my attention when I I read about Robert Oppenheimer. The, uh, who was the one uh, who split uh, the, atom, the atom and created the atomic bomb. You can basically say he's the father of the atomic bomb, but he had a different perspective. Like he was uh, asked at some point by a student at the Rochester University uh, what, during a Q&A session, um, if the bomb which exploded during the Manhattan Project, the, the first atomic bomb, was the first one to be dot detonated. And Robert, uh, Oppenheimer uh, replied sa saying that, yes, but uh, the one that exploded in modern times. So he was really aware and obsessed with the idea. He actually became, he conquered the at atom knowing that ancient civilizations did this before him. He was really intrigued by the sacred texts that are now deemed as mythological texts. So they have no value for the Western world, like um, texts like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Of course, in the Mahabharata, 
are uh, in, in the Ramayana, it's only a small part that describes the wars, but in the Mahabharata, you learn so many things about like how Vishnu goes uh, full war mode. He he becomes the destroyer of words uh, of worlds, and this is what Oppenheimer quotes when the uh, yes, he the- said, "Now I'm become death, the destroyer of worlds." Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so look, uh, I think that um, uh, you mentioned uh, some some things, uh, and uh, we uh, searched. I mean, like hundreds of people participating in the project. And uh, the first kaleidoscope effects was uh, called, um, I mean, we uh, were uh, discussing on uh, the topic of uh, one video uh, that was called Angels Don't Fall. And uh, if you are interested, we will send you the links to these videos and also to the first kaleidoscope effects that explains uh, why uh, (laughs) angels don't fall and uh, what happened. this was a pretty extensive thing. And I think Anastasia wanted to add something regarding the, um, uh, you know, just uh, the atomic bomb, right? Yeah, essentially, uh, thank you, Alexei, for mentioning this first kaleidoscope of facts and bringing this uh, thing to discussion. Uh, Raz is absolutely, I, I also was fascinated about Oppenheimer as the father of the atomic bomb. And as we like learned later, that essentially the atomic bomb was one of the technologies which Anna Nerbe, uh, like this Nazi organization, which is looking for ancient technologies, they bought this technology from those who in, Hal- in Lhasa were keeping knowledge of ancient Atlanteans. And essentially it seems to be, it is at least Atlanteans technology, but how far away it goes, we really don't know. So people, knew about this technology and unfortunately they got this technology and it's really not something makes our world better so yeah definitely and it's uh um it's very interesting that this technology uh was owned by the gods and what we know by by the gods i i thought about this uh like i pondered for a very long time who were these gods? Were they like uh, beings with uh, superpowers or were they like more like us? And I came to the idea like uh, there was this question, uh, what would be the the, be- the most acclaimed trophy of the elites, the, of the powers that be? Like they have everything they wish in life. Okay, so what would be the ultimate goal for them? And that would be like my answer was they want to become gods. And how do you become God? Simple as that. You just gather the resources when a reset, a grand reset set comes. You just survive the, the cataclysm and then you have all the power. You will be deemed as a God. You will be seen as a God by the people who after a few generations would have no idea what, what had happened. So uh, yeah, regarding, it, it's pretty bad that they use this technology, but the Mahabharata tells why, so they were like pushed to use this, and it was a different kind of like the atomic atomic technology because they they had like those they had like fire arrows that um, acted as atomic bombs. So I think they were like uh, smaller projectiles, but anyway, as destructive as this, because we can see at Mohenjo Daro that's one of the oldest and most advanced city it's actually the most advanced city of the hindu valley civilization it was leveled to the ground completely about 4000 something years ago at least from the datings and when the researchers went to study the site they found this crater like three kilometers wide crater where they find found a lot of shards from ceramic pots and this stuff and they, they found a lot of like uh, melted quartz everything transformed like in a in a glass like uh surface it actually turned into glass because we know that this happens when a lot of heat uh, pressure comes on to sand and of course this this could have been caused by a meteor like this is the more rational uh, explanation but to fall right in the middle of this uh, city that's linked to hindu mythology and has the 
also the place, like it's placed uh, in northern India, in Pakistan, northern India. So there was indeed uh, like the geographic region matches with the text in the Bhagavad Gita. That's uh, the sixth book in the Mahabharata. And apart from this, they found a lot of skeletons at one place. Uh, with uh, One skeleton had uh, radi radiation levels 50 times more than a regular uh, human, than a regular, uh, you know, artifact. And um, this, like, led to the idea that Mohenjo-Dar was wiped out by uh, a nuclear uh, blast. This and also the, the cities of Lothar and um, Harappa as well. And um, of course, uh, it's interesting to note that glass that formed uh, in different places of the world, especially in deserts. And it says in the Hindu text that wherever those uh, uh, projectiles fell, uh, they, they turned the place into a desert that wouldn't be inhabited for thousands, tens of thousands of years. Uh, and we have we find a lot of glass in the desert, and this is what uh, like a dependent of King Tut Tutankhamun uh, had a scarab made of glass. So glass was was held in uh, really high regard there. And it's really interesting when we look at the scale of this uh, wars. Uh, firstly, because they, they they didn't only happen in um, Hindu Valley uh, in the Hindus Valley. We only know this from the Hindu texts, but we also have our Western texts, like when uh, from the time of the Israel Israeli people, when they tried to uh, conquer the promise to conquer the promised land, like in southern Levant. This is when uh, they were helped by uh, Yahweh, who was their god. This Yahweh is a god that goes back to the to, to Canaanites time is very interesting but they he helped the Israelites conquer the land by using um, technological means advanced technological means that were above anything people saw at that point in time and there's also there's also a book and I want to thank Christian for uh, mentioning it this in one of our discussions because I had no idea it's called the 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 lost is the book of the wars of Yahweh but this is this book is lost is lost forever presumably maybe somebody has it somewhere but it's lost for us we don't know anything but what this book uh, told us uh, it actually broke into details the war, how Yahweh helped the Israelites conquer all the the cities in southern Levant and take uh, Israel for themselves because we know about. Uh, this like this is the reason like the people of Israel were so terrified by what they found there in the promised land that they were condemned by Yahweh to wander for another generation so for another 40 years uh, into the desert because they uh, weren't confident that Yahweh could help them achieve victory over the people of southern Levant which were some of them were giants they were the offspring of the, the Nephilim, they were like uh, all the tribes of giants mentioned in the Bible, in Apocrypha texts, in the Quran. So yeah, we had this, we had this wars pretty much everywhere. And I'm really intrigued by the evidence. Now, I've seen this, I just want to uh, say, say about a few places that I've seen traces of what I believe are uh, uh, nuclear explosions. Why I believe this is because the, the stone looks melted, uh, has a melt, melting structure, uh, texture. Apart from this, there are uh, basically places like chunks of the buildings of the megalithic structures that are scattered, are thrown away kilometers uh, apart from the, the, the center with absolutely no uh, reason being there. I'm talking here about uh, Petra, which is very interesting. But then there's this, like besides the melted like uh, texture, there's this uh, uh, tar-like uh, topping on top of this, like uh, it's, it's black, it looks like it's been hit 
by an explosion. I don't know if it's mold. I really want to reach to all these sites and take some samples and see if it's about this. But I found similarities between uh, places in Japan, in uh, Yonaguni Peninsula. There are so many such examples. Uh, I found this in, uh, Thur in Turkey at the uh, Lyth Lyth Lycian uh, city of uh, Media. Uh, I found this uh, in a temple, temple of uh, Athen, uh, Athens, yeah, in Athens, uh, at the Baha Caves in uh, India, also at the Barabar Caves in India. Uh, and I want to point out that these caves were cut with uh, machine-like precision. There's no way people could have uh, done that with rudimental tools, like polishing the surface and obtaining such perfect not only straight angles but also like an, like arches and all this stuff and if you look at the barabar caves they look like actual nuclear shelters and yeah we know the the worst happened in this area of india and pakistan also if you look uh, uh, at e in egypt you find something at hathor temple there are some stairs that uh, look pretty much melted there's a hole in the uh, in the wall that uh, kind of uh, points out that a uh, powerful weapon went through there. Of course, uh, those can only be traces of erosion, like people, like na natural erosion and caused by people who came down the stairs, maybe with some heavy objects and this stuff. But there's just, I think there's just so much evidence that points towards this hypothesis that ancient nuclear wars occur occurred in um, ancient times. But not not limited to to this area of uh, Mesopotamia, Indus Valley, and everything encompassing India. I think they they've been going on in many other places, you know. And it's it's I think it's pretty simple to prove this by taking samples from uh, from all these sites by uh, like because I don't think any scholar yet has has gone there with an open mind to study the possibility of. Uh, nuclear wars and just taking samples. So uh, that's why it's, uh, it's good to have a connected uh, community of people who can actually reach to that places and take some samples and then come uh, bring, bring the evidence together, put them, uh, put them together and uh, see what conclusions we reach. Because uh, I've seen people calling this like at the sites, uh, oh, I forgot to mention the site in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, city of Hegra or Mad Madain Saleh. It's also they, it's also has this uh, feature of melted rock, and uh, yeah, if we can, uh, people have been screaming at this. They said it's erosion. It's not. It's nothing there but erosion. But if you look at the erosion on the sandstone around granite, uh, granite, it's nothing like that pitch-like uh, topping that's covering all these uh, structures and uh, there's also the, the the melted features it's for me it's pretty obvious how some of the structures survived uh, like in the case of petra now they, they found and thank you christian for for bringing this up they found a really big uh, structure actually what was left of it because it was leveled to the ground like in the open and i think it would have happened the same in Petra, if not for the shafts that go through the rocks, like they, when they build the city of Petra and they want us to believe they were the Nabataeans who were like a nomadic people. I don't know how, how they could have achieved this. But anyway, uh, I think the structures there survived because they, was, they were built in such a way that prevented all the city from being lost. They, they, they are built on, uh, on uh, canyons. So there are like shafts that are that protect them from the from the nuclear blasts. Of course, the city of Petra, uh, I believe, was uh, much more like was much more bigger than we can see today. Those are just the remains, but it was built strategically in a way to leave the evidence for the generations to come to realize what happened in the past. And uh, yeah, it's 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 a it's a pretty hard to swallow pill as Jason uh, mentioned, but taking it like step by step, little by little, uh, everybody can understand 
that this hi this hypothesis uh, has some uh, at least a grain of truth to it. So yeah, it's really important. It's really important for us to connect as a community and to engage in discovering all into uh, discovering all the pieces of the the puzzle and uh, gluing them together. <laughs>